स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया This problem session is going to be based on a very special ring, the ring of quaternions. The ring of quaternions uh, was discovered by Sir William Rowan Hamilton, an Irish mathematician, in the year 1843. So, in the time of Hamilton, uh, we already knew about the complex numbers. So, this gave a way of multiplying pairs of real numbers. You could think of a real number as a pair uh, a comma b, a pair of real numbers, as a complex number a plus b times i, and then using the rule i squared equals minus one, you could multiply such pairs of real numbers. What Hamilton was trying to do is he was trying to find a way to multiply triples of real numbers. So he would try to write a triple of real numbers as a plus b i plus c j. And then try to see if he could find a rule for multiplying them that would result in a ring. And uh, Hamilton was not able to do that. But one day he suddenly realized that if instead of triples you take quadruples of real numbers, then you can find a ring. So let's see how Hamilton did this. You are already familiar with the group of quaternions which we talked about in the first week of this course. So, in order to have the group of quaternions, we had uh, four matrices: uh, one, which is just the identity matrix, one, zero, zero, one; the matrix which I called I, which is the matrix zero, one, minus one, zero; the matrix J, which I called uh, zero I, I zero; and the matrix K which is minus i 0 0 i and we've seen that these matrices satisfy the relations i squared equals j squared equals k squared is the negative of the identity matrix and that i j is equal to k but if you do j times i then it's minus k and then j k is i which is minus kj and ki is j which is minus ik. So these were the rules for multiplying quaternions and we had this group called the quaternion group consisting of eight elements i, j, k, 1 and the negative. Now, the ring of quaternions is defined as H is the real span of 1 i j k. So, what does this mean? These four elements can be thought of as vectors in the vector space M to C of 2 by 2 complex matrices. Now this is a four dimensional vector space over the complex numbers and therefore an eight dimensional vector space over the real numbers. And H is a four dimensional subspace of that eight dimensional vector space spanned by these four uh, obviously linearly independent um, vectors. Okay, so that's the definition of quaternions and we endow it with two binary operations addition and multiplication both uh, both inherited from matrices. So H, then we endow it with plus and dot. This is matrix addition and this is matrix multiplication. And that for you defines the quaternion. Okay, problem one.
show that h plus dot is a ring. Okay, I already called it the ring of quaternions, but we need to check that it is really a ring. Okay, so uh, we need to show certain things. We need to show that h comma plus is an abelian group. We need to show that h comma dot is a monoid. We need to prove associativity and we need to prove unitality. So let's start with the first. So we want to show that h comma plus is an abelian group. So why is this true? But do we need to go and check uh, associativity, identity, inverse and so on? No, we don't need to. Uh, we just accept the fact to start with that m to c is a ring and so m to c plus is an abelian group. So we just need to check that H plus is a subgroup. Indeed, zero belongs to H. If P and Q are in H, then p plus q is in h and if p is in h then minus p belongs to h all because h is a linear subspace of m to c the vector space m to c so any subspace of a vector space is an abelian group under a degree now the next thing we need to check is that h comma dot is a monoid. And again we don't need to check associativity because it is inherited from, uh, from m to c. That means we know that matrix multiplication is associative so when we restrict it to h it will also be associative. The only thing we need to check uh, is that, uh, well firstly the identity, the unit of M to C is the identity matrix which belongs to H. So the unit is there and then the only thing we need to check is that H is closed under multiplication. But this is not very difficult. Uh, if we have two elements, uh, let's say um, p equals if p and q are in h, then we need to show that p q is in h. So suppose I write p equals s times one plus uh, let's say v one times i plus v two times j plus v three times k. Um, the choice of this weird notation will become clear a little later. For now, it doesn't really matter where S, V1, V2, V3 are in R and Q is T times 1 plus W1 times I plus W2 times J plus W3 times K where T, W1, W2, W3 are in R. Then we need to show that PQ belongs to H. So what we can see is that PQ, well, it's going to be S times 1 plus V1I plus V2J plus V3K. And uh, we have to multiply that by T times 1 plus W1I plus W2J plus W3K. And this is going to be a sum of terms of the form So when you use distributivity to expand this product is a sum of terms of the form alpha times xy where alpha belongs to R, x 
maybe I should write alpha into x dot y where alpha belongs to R it's just a scalar and x and y are elements of the quaternion group Q for example one of the terms would be v1 times i into w2 times g so that will be v1 w2 into i times g and that's exactly what this alpha is v1 w2 and this x is i and y is g but because q is a group x y uh, belongs to q it's an element of q itself so p q is a sum is a linear combination of elements of q hence by definition of h p q belongs to h because p q is precisely the linear span of the elements of q for the associativity of multiplication uh, we don't need to um, do anything because associativity is just inherited from M2C. It holds in M2C and we are using the same addition and multiplication so it must hold in H. And finally the last axiom was the identity axiom and that is also true because indeed 1 of M2C is 1 which belongs to H. So uh, rather not identity I want to call this unitality right. So we can conclude that H is indeed a unital ring or what we just call a ring. Okay, the next problem, problem 2 is H commutative. Well, this is an easy one, right? What do you think? You are right, the answer is no because Ij is K but that is not equal to ji which is minus k. So the ring is not commutative. There is example of two things in this ring which do not commute. Okay, Let us take a closer look at the multiplication. Uh, earlier while proving that h is a ring I kind of chickened out of you know expanding this full product. I will do that now but I will do it a little carefully so that it is uh, you know things are somewhat manageable. And now you will also see why I introduced that strange notation for writing quaternions. So uh, here is the thing. So let us write V to be um, V1i uh, V1 plus V2j plus V3k for V1, V2, V3. in R cubed. So we are going to think of uh, vectors in three dimensional Euclidean space as quaternions whose this coefficient of 1 in a quaternion is called the real part so we, and the rest of it the coefficients of i, j and k added up is uh, that is called the imaginary part in analogy with the complex numbers. So we are going to think of vectors in R3 as imaginary quaternions quaternions of the form v1i plus v2j plus v3k and that corresponds to vector v1, v2, v3 in R cubed. And uh, let us uh, write uh, w equals w1i plus w2j plus w3k. And now the exercise is to write down the product of v and w. So I will give it as a show that. So part A, show that if I multiply V and W, then this is equal to minus, so the formula is really beautiful. Uh, so this is multiplication in the quaternions and now I am going to introduce the dot product of vectors. So maybe from now on when I am multiplying quaternions, I will leave out the dot uh, entirely as we often do in this. V times W is minus V dot. So this is the dot product in R cubed plus V cross W. 
So what I mean by this, this is this is just a real number. So actually what I mean is that we're taking this times one. Okay, but this one is going to be omitted in uh, what I write from now on. And uh, this is, uh, well, just a straightforward calculation. Just do it. So we have v1 times i plus v2 times j plus v3 times k multiplied by w1 times i plus w2 times j plus w3 times k. And so now let's look at the terms where we take the same term. I take the first term in the first factor and the first term in the second factor, first term in this first, second term in the first factor and second term in the second factor, third term in the first factor and third term in the second. So I, I dot i is min, minus 1, j dot j is minus 1, k dot k is minus 1. So I'll get exactly minus uh, v1 w1 plus v2 w2 plus v3 w3. So you see this first part, v dot w showing up. And then uh, what's the coefficient of i? So how many ways can I get i? I can get uh, i as uh, uh, so uh, j times k, so I take j in the first factor and k in the second factor or I can get i as the negative of k times j. So I will get i times and then I will take j times k. So v2 w3 minus v3 w2 plus j times and uh, Similarly, I'll get v3 w1 minus v1 w3 plus k times v1 w2 minus v2 w3. And that's exactly the right hand side. Okay. So uh, before we go further, let me just recall for you what V cross W is. This, this is the cross product, right? And what is its geometrical interpretation? So um, V cross W. So it is a vector uh, which is lies in the plane in the line perpendicular to the plane spanned by V and W. And its direction is given by the right hand rule. So what is the right hand rule? Uh, so you look at my right hand here. So if, if my thumb is V, my index finger is W, uh, then my middle finger is the direction in which uh, V cross W will be. Okay, so that's what I mean by direction given by the right hand rule. So now the direction is completely determined. It's in the, it's, 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 um, you know, so once I know the plane spanned by V and W, then it has to be either this thing or it has to be thing in the opposite direction. But now I'm saying by the right hand rule that it will be in this direction and the magnitude of this vector is magnitude of V times magnitude of W times sine theta where theta is the angle between from V to W, so, so to speak. In the plane spanned by V and W. Okay, so that was the definition of cross products, just to remind you. Okay, let's move on, part B of this problem. So suppose we know that s squared plus the magnitude of w squared, uh, let's just say v squared, I'll use the same notation as before, uh, is not equal to 0, 
then show that um, so this p remember is the quaternion given by uh, okay and so let p be the quaternion given by s times identity s times 1 plus v show that P inverse is equal to S minus V divided by S squared plus norm V squared. And uh, this is very easy. Uh, you just look at S plus V times S minus V and then you multiply. Uh, we already know something about the product of uh, uh, two uh, imaginary quaternions, so we will use that. So this becomes uh, S times V minus S times V, these cross terms, uh, S commutes with V uh, because the identity matrix commutes with everything. And then we have uh, S squared of course and then we have the term V dot, uh, V multiplied by V. But uh, uh, so this will be minus V minus uh, v squared minus v cross v. But uh, that's just, uh, sorry, it's plus v squared because uh, over here we had a minus sign. There's a minus sign over here. So, so well, these these terms cancel out, and v cross v is going to be zero because the angle from v to itself is zero, so that sine term will kill it, and so what we get is that this is just s squared plus. So this is just a multiple of one, and so when I say this, uh, it, it, you can think of this as scalar multiple, and so from this, the identity follows. Okay, so uh, let's just pause to make this observation here that every non-zero quaternion is invertible. This is very rare in a ring and uh, we have, we know some examples of rings where every non-zero element is invertible and those are fields like the real numbers, the complex numbers, the rational numbers and then finite fields. But in fields, multiplication is commutative and in the quaternions every non-zero element is invertible but multiplication is not commutative. So this quaternions are an example of what is called a division ring. So quaternions form a division ring. Every non-zero element of H is invertible. This is what we call a division ring. A ring not necessarily commutative where every non-zero element is inverted. We now come to the most interesting problem of uh, this uh, session uh, which is the which is called the quaternion uh, rotation identity. So I guess this is problem four, the quaternion rotation identity. And uh, how does it work? So, uh, so suppose I take uh, u to be in R cubed, a unit vector. So u1 squared plus u2 squared plus u3 squared is equal to u. And I can think of u, uh, this as an imaginary quaternion. So u is equal to u1i plus u2j plus u3k. 
in the quaternions. And uh, I will think of a uh, vector v in R3 again as a quaternion v is v1 i plus v2 j plus v3 k. Okay, so I am going to think of vectors in R3 as imaginary quaternions as I said before. And now let us take q, I will define it as cos of alpha by 2 times 1 of course, so this is a quaternion plus u times sine of alpha by 2. So this is an element of h. Okay, so the problem is show that the function v goes to q v q inverse. So q is a non-zero quaternion uh, because either cos of alpha by 2 or sin of alpha by 2 will be non-zero and u is a unit vector. So in any case, q will be a non-zero quaternion. We can definitely invert it. So what does this function do? Rotates the vector v about the axis u. So think of u, u as a vector in R3. Think of it as an axis by angle alpha. the same alpha that is appearing in the definition of q. Uh, in the direction given by the right hand screw rule. Or right handed screw rule. So again uh, you look at my hand. Uh, the rule says that if my thumb is pointing in the direction u, uh, then if alpha is a positive angle, then the rotation will be by angle alpha in the direction indicated by my fingers. Okay, so that is the problem. Okay, so let us see how we can solve this problem. So to start with, observe that both v goes to q v q inverse and v goes to okay so let's just introduce some notation let's take r uh, u alpha of v to denote the rotation of v by angle alpha about u as given by the right hand screw rule of course r u alpha that both these are are both linear transformations from r cubed to r cubed but a linear transformation is completely determined by its value on any spanning set. So it suffices to show that we want to show that these two linear transformations are equal. So it suffices to show that they are equal on some spanning set of R cubes. on a spanning set. So to start with, we will take uh, case 1 where v is u itself, okay, the unit vector u. So in this case, of course, r uh, u alpha of u, well, if you rotate u about uh, the axis u, it does not change at all, so that is u itself. Okay. So we need to just calculate q u q inverse. So that is um, cos alpha by 2 plus u sin alpha by 2 times u times cos alpha by 2 minus u 
sign alpha beta. This is from com this last term is coming from the inversion formula, and then using distributivity, we get cos alpha by two u times cos alpha by two plus u times u, but that's uh, just uh, 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 so the, the real part will be the dot product of u with itself but the negative so that's uh, minus 1 times sine alpha by 2. And now we need to take this and multiply it by cos alpha by 2 minus u times sine alpha by 2. So that multiplication uh, formula for two imaginary quaternions uh, makes life quite easy. And so now if you do this, then you will get u times cos squared alpha by 2. That is the first term. And then you will get uh, uh, u times u multiplied by cos alpha by 2 sin alpha by 2 with a negative sign. So that uh, u, u times u gives just uh, minus 1. Uh, so we will get a plus sign now and we will get cos alpha by 2 sin alpha by 2. And now let us multiply this thing. So here we get again u times we get minus sin alpha by 2 cos alpha by 2. And then the last term is uh, plus u sine squared alpha by 2. So these two terms cancel out and these two add up to give u. So we see that uh, the rotation and the q v q inverse they agree upon the vector u itself. Okay, and now let us take case 2 where v is perpendicular to u. If we can show that it is true for v equal to u and v perpendicular to u, then we have shown that these two uh, linear transformations are equal for every vector in R3. So now we have q v q inverse. Well, this is um, cos alpha by 2 plus u sin alpha by 2 v cos alpha by 2 minus u sin alpha by 2 and that is cos alpha by 2 v. Uh, let me write it as v cos alpha by 2 and uh, u cross v. sin alpha by 2 cos alpha by 2 minus u dot v but u is perpendicular to v so that term will go away u dot v uh, sin alpha by 2 cos alpha by 2 so let us not write that so we have taken care of uh, that and now we have this multiplied by cos alpha by 2 minus u sin alpha by 2. But that is equal to, uh, so now we have v cos squared alpha by 2 and then we have uh, v cos alpha by 2 multiplied by u sin alpha by 2. So again the dot product term the real part will be 0 and we are only left with an imaginary part which will be um, minus u cross v minus v cross u but I can write it as plus u cross v and it will be accompanied by uh, cos alpha by 2 sin alpha by and now let us look at the second term in the first factor that will first give me uh, 
this was just u cross v there's no cos alpha by t it is just u cross v sin alpha by t i'm sorry right there's no cos alpha by t i don't know why i put it so i get uh, u cross v Uh, whereas here I have uh, u cross v cos alpha by 2 sin alpha by 2 okay that was the first term and for the second term I have uh, u cross v again u cross v cos alpha by 2 sin alpha by 2 and then the last I take the second term from both factors and I get uh, u cross v cross u see u cross v is already perpendicular to u so the it's perpendicular to u and to v therefore it's perpendicular to u and so the dot term will be zero and i'll just get minus u cross v cross u sine squared alpha by 2 but this thing over here u cross v cross u uh, is actually just v so what you get is just v cos squared alpha by 2 minus sin squared alpha by 2 plus u cross v and then we have 2 sin alpha by 2 cos alpha by 2 which is v times cos alpha plus u cross v times but that's just the formula for rotation uh, about uh, in, in the vectors v and u cross v which means that it's a rotation by angle alpha uh, in the axis perpendicular to u and so that solves the last problem now this last uh, property is actually very um, uh, important uh, in, in, in real life I mean well uh, so this quaternion rotation identity gives a very simple way to compute uh, the rotation of vectors about any axis by any angle and this is used all the time in computer graphics so when you have your video game and you're running around and turning every time you turn uh, well you have an axis by which you turn and an angle by which you turn and those computations before rendering are done using the quaternion rotation identity so Hamiltonian, Hamilton's quaternions discovered in um, 1843 well, they are still used today to give uh, fast rendering of uh, graphics, 3D graphics in video games. Now, isn't that cool? Uh, 